So along about this same time, people were doing experiments, kind of similar if you think about Thompson's experiment with his cathode ray tube, where they had um, element gases in tubes and they passed current through them. So it turns out that when electric current is passed through a vacuum tube that contains hydrogen gas, a pink glow is observed. So if that light is then passed through a prism, it separates out into four bands of visible light. So you might have used a spectroscope like this at the junior high. You'll be doing a lab later this week that includes this. And this is a spectroscope. It has a little prism in it. And you look through it, and then you pass light through it, and it separates it out into lines. So again, this is an example of uh, a vacuum tube with, for instance, hydrogen in it. And then you look through this spectroscope where it passes it through a prism and it separates out the lines according to their different wavelengths. So the bands that we see are part of hydrogen's emission line spectrum. And so here you see that there are four bands in hydrogen's emission spectrum. And there are two additional series that were discovered, but they are not in the visible region. So the hydrogen spectrum contains three groups of lines. Only one group is visible, that's the Balmer series. The other two are the Lyman series, which is in the ultraviolet region, and the Passion series, which is in the infrared region. I like to tell my students that the Balmer series is visible and that Balmer rhymes with Palmer, and Mr. Palmer is visible. We see him walking around the department. So how do atoms produce light? Atoms produce light when they absorb and release energy in the form of photons. So atoms absorb and release photons as electrons move from one energy level to another. So this particular illustration shows you that if you have incoming light and it comes in, the electron, if it's the right frequency of light, the electron can absorb it and jump to a higher energy level. Again, here you have a different frequency of light. The energy comes in, the electron absorbs it, and jumps to a different energy level. So here it jumped from n equals 1 to 3. Here it jumped from n equals 2 to 3. And then what happens is eventually that electron that absorbed the energy and got to a higher energy state will relax. And when it relaxes, it emits the same frequency of energy. So hydrogen only has one electron in its lowest energy level, and that is said to be in its ground state. So when an electron is in its lowest possible energy level, it is said to be in the ground state, and that's n equals 1 for hydrogen. When it's excited and it absorbs energy, it can go up to energy levels 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, which you'll recall we learned there are seven possible energy levels. So the emission spectrum is showing the excited state. So the lowest energy state of an atom is its ground state. And when it absorbs energy, it achieves a higher energy state, which we refer to as its excited state. And in terms of understanding it, you can think of me, Ms. Augustine, when I've had too much coffee. So normally I'm pretty chill, and then if I drink too much coffee, I get very excited, and then eventually I relax back down to my normal state when the caffeine wears off, and I'm back in my ground state again. So when we're talking about light and atomic spectra, the atomic emission spectra are not continuous like sunlight. Each line in the atomic emission spectrum represents a distinct frequency and wavelength that's associated with how much energy was absorbed by an electron when it jumped up to a different energy level and released. And again, every element has a unique emission spectrum. So classical atomic theories predicted that hydrogen would emit a continuous range of frequencies and have a continuous spectrum. And attempts to explain it 
led to this new theory called the quantum theory. And when an excited hydrogen atom falls to its ground state and emits a photon of radiation, that's when you see the light. So light is absorbed as energy, and when it is released again, it comes out at the same frequency, wavelength, and energy. So you'll recall that we had talked about the Bohr model, where Bohr proposed that electrons have fixed energy and move in energy levels around the nucleus, which was why they don't fall into the nucleus. And it turned out that Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom explained the observed lines in hydrogen spectrum. Unfortunately, his model did not explain the spectrum of atoms that had more than one electron, because it gets obviously way more complicated the more electrons there are. So for that, someone named de Broglie, Louis de Broglie, uh, explained that electrons can be thought of as waves. And he suggested that they can be considered as waves confined around an atomic nucleus. So the electron waves can only exist at specific frequencies that correspond to specific energies, the quantized energies that Bohr spoke about in his orbits and his hypothesis was confirmed by experiments. So de Broglie's equation is written as wa wavelength lambda is equal to h, that's our friend Planck's constant, divided by mv, which is mass times velocity. So again, the de Broglie equation, which you will not be responsible for calculating, but I just show it to you because it's in your chapter. De Broglie's equation states that wavelength lambda is equal to h, Planck's constant, divided by m, mass of the particle, and v, the velocity of a particle. So when we're talking about classical mechanics, that predicts the motion of large bodies. And when we're talking about classical mechanics, which you'll learn much more about next year in physics, we're talking about things like footballs and cars and things. But in the quantum world, quantum mechanics describes the motion of subatomic particles, which are obviously very, very tiny. And again, the energy is described as specific quanta or quantums or amounts of energy. So the last thing we talk about is something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And Werner Heisenberg, in 1927, proposed his principle. And what his principle says is that it is impossible to know simultaneously both the position and the velocity of an electron or any other subatomic particle. So simply stated, you can't tell where an electron is, its position, and how fast it's going, the velocity, at the same time. Now, when we're doing this, you have to understand that we're talking about subatomic particles. So, for instance, if you're talking about a football or a car, you can know those two things at the same time because they are much more um, predictable, huge particles. They're the macroscopic world. But in the subatomic world, where you're talking about electrons with a mass of zero and they're moving at a very, very rapid pace, you can see how this makes sense. That if you know exactly where an electron is, then you don't know how fast it's going. And if you know exactly how fast it's going, then you can't really pinpoint where it is. So that pretty much concludes the chapter for uh, chapter 13.3. So for now, I'm going to end this slideshow, and you will now watch a short video from the Crash Course in Chemistry series, and I will set that up for you on my website.